Hi, this is Michael Adams for Stock Telegraph. Um, today we invited for our CEO roaster Corey Diaz from Anfield Resources. Um, Anfield Resources is trading on the T6 Venture and the symbol is ARY. And um, Anfield was able to issue two really important news releases this week. One was a resource update, a 4311 resource update, and the other one was news about a, a potential credit facility. And I've invited, uh, besides Corey, I've invited my colleague uh, Joachim Brunner from Austria, and we're really Really curious what Corey can um, give us as insight into these new releases. Okay, I have to start with a really bad joke. Um, so, Buenos Dias, Mr. Dias. And uh, <laughs> thanks for. T <laughs> I had to say that, sorry. Um, so, thanks for taking the time to talk to us, especially because uh, I guess it's a really busy day on your end. Um, in my introduction, we already, or in my introduction, I already discussed that um, Anfield Resources has issued two really good news releases this week. One was on Tuesday and one was actually today. Um, one was about the resource update and the other one was about the credit facility. And this is the reason why we invited you, Diet, to, um, to give us more insight on this. Um, so maybe just as uh, uh, an introduction, uh, as a, a starting point, um, I'm a consultant to uh, Anfield, and uh, so is Joe Brunner. He's uh, a service provider um, for Anfield. So you have to make up your own mind, and um, yeah, uh, it might be that if we have some opinions that these are biased. Okay, that was the legal stuff. Now up to you, Corey. Well, thanks for the invitation, and I appreciate you guys uh, taking the time to chat with me. Uh, with regard to Anfield and uh, the recent transaction. Uh, the press releases you discussed, uh, the first one on Tuesday related to the 43101 compliant resource and the, uh, the, pre the uh, press release from today, uh, which was related to uh, securing a credit facility or we're in the process of securing a credit facility uh, in order to close the transaction, uh, I think are both uh, very important steps uh, in moving the company forward. First of all, with the 43101 resource, uh, we had to put a resource in place as uh, one of the requirements related to uh, the TSX Venture allowing us to close the transaction. Uh, in order okay. to close any type of transaction of this nature, you need to have a resource in place uh, which shows that there's a property of merit uh, being acquired. Uh, the resource was, um, was outlined generally by Uranium One in the past, but the actual resource itself had never been uh, filed with any uh, public entity, so uh, we actually had to go back and do the work uh, in order to make sure that the resource was in fact so sound, and uh, we were able to do so uh, in a fairly expeditious uh, time period. So we're very happy with the resource. We've confirmed that the resource is what it was claimed to be. Uh, okay. We think that's an important step because fr from this point on, we will look to uh, place economics on the project uh, once we've actually closed the transaction. Secondly, and, and related to that, uh, we did uh, issue a press release today related to the financing. We are working with a U.S. lender at this point uh, who will be uh, looking to provide us with the financing, which would not only allow us to close the transaction, but also start moving some of these assets uh, forward. In terms Corey, of well, let me ask you a question. Was the reason to go into the U.S. for finding a lender, was that, that the project is also in the United States, or did you also look in other countries? Well, uh, you know, primarily it was, uh, you know, obviously given that I'm from Toronto, we looked at the Toronto market. Uh, you know, the the opportunities in the Toronto market were fairly limited. I think, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, the TSX Venture has had uh, a significant fall over the past few months, which has made lending quite difficult. And investors are, are sitting on their hands for the most part, uh, not looking to necessarily invest in new opportunities. Uh, so, you know, we thought that going to the U.S., and given that we have U.S. assets, uh, it would be quite appropriate, and you know, U.S. markets yep. would understand U.S. assets. So, right. uh, we've we've gotten a great reception out of the U.S., and uh, this is one of the reasons why we've chosen to work mm -hmm. with uh, groups in the U.S. H how long did it take you to come, like since uh, since the first contact, yeah, with the landing group? And so, how long did it take you to come to this uh, stage right now? Is it like weeks or months or? Uh, it probably uh, probably two or three weeks uh, to come oh, okay. to the the the, uh, the term sheet stage. 
uh, we had had discussions over a period of time, uh, but it you know started to accelerate pretty quickly once uh, the lender understood the nature of our business, uh, understood the possibility and the opportunities moving forward, uh, not just at this stage but you know in the future moving these products through to production. Uh, I think that uh, the lender saw that there could be opportunities in the future for uh, it to get involved with us. Okay. Corey, um, Corey, so um, is, do you find that uh, is, is maybe the mood also changing against uranium uh, or uranium projects and so on? Or is well, it you know, yeah. the – sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, go, go ahead. I was just going to say that, uh, you know, the, the, the mood against uranium has been quite strong for uh, probably a number of years obviously since Fukushima 2011. Uh, what we found, uh, even in the summer, you know, the, the mood, the sentiment was quite, uh, you know, it was quite negative uh, moving towards the summer. But, you know, we've seen uh, a couple of green shoots, I guess you could say, uh, in the marketplace since the summer. Obviously, uh, news of Japan uh, looking to turn back on a few reactors has been obviously positive for the marketplace. Uh, the fact that China has been building out a significant number of reactors uh, and needs a significant number of reactors in order to you know, meet demand uh, in the coming years is obviously another piece of positive news. Uh, you know, I think that um, you know it, it's been it's been a very a very shaky market for the most part. But I think you know, given the way that uh, the spot price has moved back up from $28 low, uh, you know, a, a near-term low or a longer-term low, uh, to close to $40. Uh, is showing that there's some more positive sentiment and positive momentum in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, quick other question on the lenders. Um, have the lenders, in, 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 as they did their due diligence, um, have they been to the project? No, this is part of the process. Uh, they're in the process now of choosing an appraiser. Oh, okay. Uh, we will know by the end of this week uh, you know, who the appraiser will be. Okay. And, and um, uh, yep. at that point, the appraiser will go on site in order to uh, obviously appraise the assets and, and determine the value. Oh, okay. Is there kind of a, a, a timeline, yeah, um, so f uh, until the final decision? Well, uh, you know, our timeline is essentially getting something done by the end of the year. Uh, okay. We'd like to be at the stage where uh, we have a lending decision by the end of the year. So, we're, you know, okay. I think the, the lender understands our position and, and seems to be very comfortable with our position. Okay, and um, as far as I understand it, yeah, if you can secure this credit facility, um, that is, is like the, the last missing piece of the puzzle. Is that right? Because you have the 4311 um, update, you got all this, like this legal stuff, yeah, from the T6 Venture, and all these permits can be transferred uh, from Uranium right. One to you. So that's all in place. Right. Everything is conditional. So uh, you know the 43101. Uh, basically moves our conditional approval from the TSX Venture to a final approval, obviously pending uh, the other pieces being in place, financing, etc. Uh, there's also what's called a CFIUS uh, ruling which needs to take place, and that's basically the U.S. government understanding that uh, you know they're comfortable with us as a foreign entity owning assets of this nature in the U.S. Okay. Um, you know, I think there are a couple of other steps, but the financing is probably the largest one that remains. Uh, and if we have the financing in place, everything else kind of falls into place. We've got, as you mentioned, the UDRC has approved the transfer of the radioactive materials license, and that's also pending uh, having the financing in place. So I think okay. uh, you know everything kind of uh, you know is related to to this financing, and that's why we're very excited at the prospect of having this financing uh, right. completed. Yeah, okay. So if you'd like to just run us through the presentation, um, and I guess we sure. will have a couple of more questions. Okay, sure, sure. Let's start. I'll start with uh, page two. Uh, obviously, forward looking statements, uh, safe harbor. We want to make sure that uh, everybody understands that and very comfortable that you know we are talking about. Um, we'll be talking about some future numbers, but uh, you know, those are all. Um, those are numbers that, that shouldn't be taken uh, in isolation, and, and obviously there's risk to uh, those numbers being accurate or inaccurate. But these are just, uh, and, and for the most part, for illustrative purposes only. And I think it's very important for uh, viewers or investors to understand that. Right. It's the usual, the usual legal stuff everybody yeah. has to go through. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Please okay. read page two of the uh, <laughs> yeah. presentation prior to going through the rest of the presentation. Uh, company profile on page three. Uh, the recent stock price is obviously a little bit lower than uh, what's listed here, but the common shares, you know, we're a very, 
we have a very tight share structure, 20 million shares outstanding, uh, 2 million warrants, and obviously, sorry, 2 million options and uh, <coughs> warrants in place, which, uh, you know, the two hundred fifty, the two dollar fifty cent uh, warrants clearly uh, are out of the money, but the other ones have been in and around the money for the past few months. But uh, you know, we're expecting that uh, hopefully on the back of good news, those warrants will be uh, in the money and certainly uh, available to us uh, to put into our till. How long are these? How long yeah. are these warrants good for? Like, what's the last day f to exercise them? Well, we have uh, some of those forty cent warrants are due in uh, the end of January, early February. Okay. Uh, or expire. Uh, the 65 cent warrants are, uh, I believe, in May, and then there are some warrants that are, are um, actually are um, expiring in August. Okay. So all of them are for next year. Okay. 2015. And just the transaction summary. Uh, when we talk about uranium in general <coughs> and uh, nuclear power, uh, the U.S. is is a uh, is a net importer of uranium uh, consumes a significantly uh, larger amount of uranium than it actually produces. Uh, 55 million pounds generally used a year uh, and produces uh, 5 million pounds or less every year. So uh, clearly the U.S. could use uh, more, more production domestically uh, in order to fulfill uh, its needs. Uh, uranium, as I mentioned, has been at a historically low price. Uh, the price ran up to over $100 back in the mid-2000s and has obviously fallen off significantly since then, as I mentioned, $28 earlier this year, uh, but it started to creep up again, uh, which is obviously setting a po positive tone uh, in the marketplace. Uh, increasing consumption, uh, despite all the negative talk about uh, the uranium space, there are uh, nuclear reactors being built today. Uh, 72 reactors currently under construction, 28 of those are in China, so China is obviously the leader in terms of uh, pushing this market forward. So. Uh, you can see that, uh, you know, despite all the negative news, you know, construction continues. There are over uh, 430 uh, reactors in various stages, whether it's construction, uh, planning, or proposed uh, in the world, which would, uh, which would significantly increase the number of reactors uh, operating worldwide should all of these uh, move into production. And, and you've got to remember, not only are places like China building uh, plants, but places in the Middle East that are, are oil producers and oil exporters who are looking to build yep. nuclear power. So I think that's also an interesting angle. Uh, we talked about Japan earlier. Uh, there's been uh, preliminary approval granted for two reactors uh, to restart, which is obviously going to be positive. It's positive top line news for the market, um, given that a lot of the negative news began in Japan in 2011. And then finally, the supply deficit, the, the agreement between uh, the U.S. and Russia, which lasted for 20 years, has expired, and that represented 20 to 25 million pounds a year uh, being provided to the U.S. Right. A nuclear energy in general in the U.S., uh, 100 plants are currently under operation or currently operable uh, with five uh, under construction. So as much as there's a lot of negative news around uh, nuclear power, they're still being, plants are still being built because it's the, the cheapest, cleanest uh, energy source uh, worldwide. And you can see how significant um, and how important uh, nuclear reactors are to the power base in the U.S. They represent you know, over 19 percent of all uh, power provided or electricity generated. Okay. Seven, the acquisition, uh, I touched on this a little bit, but the acquisition consists of a number of different assets. Uh, first of all, the Shooter and Canyon Mill uh, it's one of only three licensed uranium mills in the U.S. I think that's very important. Back in the 1980s, there were over <coughs> 40, um, and now there are only three. And and the difficulty of building a new uh, a new mill at this stage is is significant. Um, recently, a competitor sold a licensed and permitted mill site in Colorado, uh, and they basically stated that it would cost too much money in order to build a mill there. They said it would roughly cost between $150 million to $200 million for a 500 ton per day mill. Uh, the mill that we're acquiring is 750 tons per day. So that gives you an idea as to the implied value of our mill, uh, given how, you know, given the pricing provided by the competitor. Uh, and once again, it, it, it's also scarcity value in this marketplace. You're talking about the cost to build a mill. There's also the timeline to build a mill. Uh, the timeline is roughly eight to 10 years. So, okay. you know, for us to acquire a mill, 
you know, not only for a significantly less than what it would be worth, but the timeline within which to acquire and put into production is significantly shorter than it would be for us to try to do this from a greenfield perspective or from anyone else to do it. So, cool. so for us, we think it's it's a coup uh, to be able to acquire these assets. I, I totally uh, agree. Um, ca can you just give us some more information about yeah how this mill looks like? Like, is it um, up to date, or need do you need to kind of refurbish it, or invest a lot of more money, or what what's the stage right now? Sure. Uh, so you can see the picture on the right, uh, the yeah. top right, is a picture of the mill. Uh, it is uh, the youngest of the three mills that are currently standing. Uh, that said, it was built back in the 1980s. Uh, wasn't run for very long, probably four months, uh, in order to secure payment for the the construction group, essentially. Uh, right. So there are no environmental liabilities, or very few liabil uh, liabilities on the environmental side associated with the mill. Uh, so I think that's very important. Um, in terms of, it, it does need to be refurbished. It'll probably take somewhere between $25 million and $35 million in order to refurbish the mill. Uh, that said, there are ways for uh, Anfield to, to uh, get money from the state in order to uh, mitigate some of those costs. Uh, for okay. example, uh, in other states, uh, uh, there are competitors in Wyoming who have received uh, $20 million and $34 million, respectively, from the state in order to advance uh, uranium products there. So we know that there's money available in Utah for the same type right. of So uh, how many jobs, how many jobs will this mill create if it's uh, running in full production? And uh, what's the unemployment situation around this area? Well, this is in a very remote part of Utah. Uh, so okay. there are very, um, jobs would be uh, extremely welcome in the area. And there'll be at least 50 jobs created at the mill itself. Don't forget there are also mine sites that would actually have to be yep. staffed, so we're probably talking 50 to 100 at each of those mill sites, or mine sites. So, you know, anywhere between uh, 200 and 500 jobs could be uh, could be created, and certainly a large tax base for the state, which would, you know, obviously right. help, um, help pay for uh, ancillary services. Yeah. And you mentioned that this is, uh, it's on this sheet, that it's only uh, one of three licensed uh, uranium mills in the United States. So how, how was it possible for a small, tiny company like Enfield to get its, its hands on this uh, when there are bigger competitors? Well, uh, you know, I think it's a question of timing, and sometimes it's a question of luck. Uh, there was another party that actually bid for the assets back about a year ago, um, okay. an Australian company and uh, we thought that we'd lost the opportunity. Uh, unfortunately for that group, uh, the financing didn't come through, and so the assets <coughs> went back into the marketplace. And just a, you know, the confluence of the assets going back onto the market, uh, the Utah Department of Radiation Control uh, wanting this asset to be uh, either put into production or closed down, you know, put us in a great position, uh, bargaining position, in terms of being able to acquire the asset for a relatively a cheap price. Yeah, I'm just wondering why companies like, let's say, Uranium Energy, yeah, which is um, a producer, um, they have also projects in the States, why those guys didn't come up with the idea to acquire this mill? Well, I, I, I think at the same time, you know, there are also the difference between what uh, Uranium Energy is doing and, and what we're looking to do. You know, we're talking about two different resource bases. For example, uh, we're looking at hard rock mining, so conventional uranium mining versus... And they do ISL, there. right? Yeah, they yeah. do ISL or ISR. Uh, so okay. uh, a different different project. And, and they've, they're also focused in, in Texas. So, uh, you know, it's a bit of a distance away. So the mill itself probably wouldn't be conducive to uh, working with, a, with the assets that it has in, in Texas. Okay. And so in terms of the other assets we're looking to acquire, it would be including a, a resource of <coughs> 620 million pounds. Uh, some of those pounds, 4.6 million of those uh, measured and indicated pounds are, are actually uh, listed in the new resource, uh, 43101 compliant resource that we put out uh, a couple of days ago. So uh, now we've got a historical resource of 2.2 million pounds and an M&I, measured and indicated resource, of 4.6 million pounds. So um, you know, a significant uh, amount of pounds, and we would, we would look to those, um, those pounds to be the initial feed for the mill once it's up and, and in operation. Uh, thirdly, okay. there's an existing surface uh, stockpile of ore of 415,000 pounds. Uh, that clearly has value. So that's mined ore but not milled. 
So it's very easy for us to simply put that through the mill once the mill is up and running. Uh, you know, it's, it's just a stockpile. So uh, the cost to put that into production will only be related to milling costs. So it would be attractive for us to put that through the mill too. And, and actually has, it probably has market value too. We could probably sell it to somebody else who has a mill. Uh, and then uh, one thing that's not listed here, there are four royalties that we've acquired. Um, two of those royalties are with uh, a competitor's mine uh, mines, and uh, one of those is also associated with a company called Azarka Powertech. Uh, it's Dewey Burdock product up in South Dakota. Uh, there's a recent PEA that was put out by um, by Powertech, uh, which gives an implied value for that royalty, which is in the millions to us. So uh, we think that it's appealing. Uh, we certainly believe that it has some uh, some value in terms of. Uh, us, we can also keep, we can keep it, or we can actually monetize it. So it gives us some flexibility when it comes to providing further kind of financial stability to the company. Uh, so Powertech, got, well, so Powertech was just acquired or something like that. Yes, I, I it was a merger between uh, Powertech and Azarga, an Australian company. Oh right, yeah. Now it trades on the, the TSX. Yes. Okay. And then you know the assets that we're acquiring, there's significant exploration upside um, in the uh, the Henry Mountains area of Utah. Uh, and in Lisbon Valley, the most prolific mining, uh, uranium mining area in the U.S., uh, over 70, uh, 78 million pounds of production came out of that area in the past. So we think that there's <coughs> significant upside. You know, not only would, are we looking at the original resource that we're acquiring, but we'd also look to uh, build up a, a larger resource, a much substantial resource, in order to extend the life of the mill. Page 8. Uh, the shooting mill, we've, we've gone through a lot of these points already, but I think it's important to highlight uh, the replacement cost value uh, is estimated somewhere between uh, $80.5 million and $200 million. The $80.5 million figure comes from a report in 2005 which was commissioned by <coughs> U.S. Energy. Uh, U.S. Energy was a previous owner of the assets prior to Uranium One acquiring uh, the mill, uh, and the replacement cost in that report was $80.5 million. The $200 million number comes from the the uh, uh, the words of a competitor. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier talking about selling of a uh, license permitted site with no mill on it, and the cost to build that mill was between 150 to 200 million dollars. So, on a conservative sure. basis, <coughs> we're talking about a mill that's 50 percent larger than the mill discussed by the competitor. We'd say that you know the mill's worth at least 200 million dollars. Uh, in terms of proximity. The mining assets are all within trucking distance of the mill, so that's uh, an advantage to us. And there are also other ways for us to look at those mining assets, whether we look to put a heap leach on site in order to create a concentrate, which means that we can ship even further and, and improve the economics on the projects. Uh, as I mentioned previously, the mill has very little liability, environmental liabilities associated with it because it didn't run very long. Uh, and then, obviously, being located in Utah, it's a mining state, an agreement state, where we deal with state-level organizations related to uranium, the Utah, Utah Department of Radiation Control, or UDRC, <coughs> versus the National uh, Radiation Group. Okay. Page nine, you can see the picture on the right. Those are the uh, the leach tanks. Um, you know, I think they're wooden, so it's very different, uh, diff very different take. They're actually. Uh, serviced by a group out of Oregon, so it's, uh, you know, the technology is still very, uh, very amenable to being used today. Uh, we okay. talked about the size of the mill, capacity of 750 tons per day, but the capacity to actually process even more. Uh, at the stockpile at site, we've got 250,000 pounds of the 415,000 pounds of stockpiled ore at the mill itself, so very easy to move that ore directly into the mill once the mill is up and, and running again. The facility has been on care maintenance for over 30 years, but this is not a copper mill or a silver mill or a gold mill where you can just let things uh, deteriorate with no one providing any kind of oversight. Because it is uranium, there has to be significant oversight, and the UDRC does a great job of following up and making sure that air testing takes place and, and water testing takes place and make sure there's no environmental issues associated with either. So this is something that's been, um, you know, been overseen for a number of years, and I think it's very important for 
the audience to understand that. that this, is, this isn't something that's kind of falling apart. This is something that's in pristine condition. And okay. it's staffed Co at the moment, too. Uh, Corey, what, what I not really understand is uh, the, the mill produce only 7,000 pound, uh, uh, pounds of, of uranium and stockpile on the other side 400,000 outside the mill. Uh, why why did not produce or process the this the stockpile? Well, because there's a process to go through. So first of all, I guess the the stockpile has probably been accumulated over the past few years. Uh, so the mill okay. has has been on care maintenance for a number of years. And in order to process yeah. it, first of all, you'd have to change the license from uh, mm -hmm. care and maintenance to operating. And then you'd have so to this stockpile is is not happened uh, when the was was not happened when the the, the mill is running. Uh, this was happened after. Yes. The stockpile yes. is coming. Okay. In anticipation okay. of restarting the mill. Okay. Yes. Okay, that makes sense. So page ten, and once again, this is for illustrative purposes only, in terms of what the implied value of the six point eight million pounds would be. Uh, you know, depending on the uranium price, you know, we've listed a number of prices on on the uh, right-hand chart between forty and eighty dollars. You can run anywhere between two hundred and four hundred million dollars. But that is just for illustrative purposes only, just trying to give you a sense as to what the the market value of the ore could be, just from those you know, small number of pounds. And, and obviously, we're looking for uh, a, you know, a greater number of pounds. But uh, we just wanted to kind of give you a sense as to where these assets could could be valued ultimately. Okay. Page 11, uh, stockpiles we talked about. So I, I mentioned there's one at the mill itself, 250,000 pounds. There's a second one that sits in uh, Lisbon Valley uh, near one of our other mines, and that's uh, you know, probably about uh, 165,000 pounds, and it's very close to other exploration targets. So uh, not only would we look to uh, move that stockpile onto the mill, the mill site, but we'd also uh, assume that there's significant opportunities to increase the size of the stockpile potentially because uh, we're near mine sites uh, in the area. Um, one, one question. The stockpile is relatively low grade, especially compared to your resources, what you're coming up. Um, yes. is, is this a problem or is this an advantage uh, compared to your uh, mineral resources? Well, I, I mean, it's not its not a problem. The good thing is that it's already sitting at surface. So the cost, there'll be a slightly higher cost to mill uh, to mill the ore, but don't forget, we don't have any mining costs associated with it, so mm -hmm. uh, the margins should, should still be pretty reasonable. <coughs> uh, I think if we were mining it, it would be much more challenging, uh, but certainly mm -hmm. because it's already mined, uh, we're in a much better... Mm -hmm. Page 12, uh, we talked about uh, generating revenue strictly from the ore that we're acquiring. Uh, there are also a number of other ways for us to generate revenue at the site, and uh, we've seen competitors do the same thing. Uh, tone milling, which is basically the, the business of, uh, of uh, producing or processing uh, competitors' ores or uh, other peers' ores. We've already been approached by a couple of uh, entities who have uranium assets in the area uh, looking for toll milling agreements. Uh, I think it's okay. important to note that right now there's only one mill, one conventional mill that's actually in operation, and that's owned by uh, Energy Fuels. Uh, so right now Energy Fuels is the only game in town. So Energy Fuels could basically dictate what the pricing would be when it comes to toll milling agreements. Uh, with a second mill in place, obviously competition uh, ensues, and therefore pricing dynamics change. So uh, you know, I think that's an opportunity for uh, third parties to, to find a, a way to process the ore uh, at a, probably a, a different rate or a more favorable rate. Where's the location of this other mill that is already in production? Uh, the mill is also in Utah. It's okay. probably, it's, it's not too far away from uh, our assets in the Lisbon Valley area. Uh, okay. So probably closer to uh, our assets in that area than uh, to our own mill. Okay. But certainly, you know, it's, it's, it's centrally <coughs> located. Uh, we can also generate revenue through uh, a vanadium circuit. So vanadium is another byproduct of, of mining uranium. Uh, its value is, is uh, on a per pound basis, is significantly lower than 
what uranium would be. With that said, uh, if there's a significant amount of uranium found, or sorry, vanadium found in the ore, uh, it certainly provides some upside uh, in terms of revenue and cash flow generation. So it's something that we would certainly consider, given that a lot of the ore that uh, we will be recovering uh, is laden with, with vanadium. Uh, a third of all, um, there's... Sorry, uh, sorry uh, Corey, that I didn't interrupt you. Um, in your press release from, from uh, Tuesday, um, you say also that you um, acquired this um, old mine, the Velvet, I think. Or Velvet. Yeah, the, um, and that in, in, the, in the past period when they produce or mill this, this mine, uh, they produce also vanadium. Uh, yes. But um, then you're coming up to your resources calculation. There was no vanadium in there. Is is not? Uh, do you not calculate the uh, the vanadium uh, resources or? Um, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, you know, I guess for us, um, we're basically working off of a previous resource. So, uh, in the previous resource, there was no vanadium discussed. So, what we were essentially doing is confirming the the previous numbers. I think if once we acquire the assets, we would look to uh, determine what vanadium content would be associated with the uranium. But because we're essentially just confirming an old report, uh, you know, we weren't looking at a greater scope in terms of what would be found uh, within the ore. So I think in the future, we'd probably look to see what vanadium is there. But because we're looking just to confirm uh, a previous report, it didn't make any sense for us to speculate as to what vanadium would be there. I mean, and it's mm -hmm. also a timing thing, too, because it, right. would, it would take significantly more time for us to get that resource in place. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, in terms of the alternative feed source, uh, the competitor in the area uh, has, I believe, at least 14 licenses to take, essentially, waste um, and put it into or the tailings pond or the tailings uh, area uh, at its site and gets paid for it. So it's another way of generating revenue but by essentially bypassing the mining or so the milling process at the mill, and it could be fairly lucrative, uh, so as an option. And then finally, I talked about the royalty agreements that, uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, we have four <coughs> in place. Uh, the most prospective in our minds would be the Dewey Burdock project uh, with Azarga Paratech. Uh, based on the PEA, it looks like it could be worth uh, a few million dollars to us, obviously. Uh, depending on what production looks like and what pro production profile, how close it is related to the PEA itself. Uh, but we know that there's certainly value there, and uh, you know, I believe as Arga Paratech understands that there's value there, so there may be an opportunity for us to monetize that should we choose to go that route or simply hold on to it in order to uh, find another revenue stream for ourselves. We have two okay. others which are with uh, energy fuels projects. Uh, obviously, those ones are currently on care and maintenance, given the uranium price uh, at the moment. Uh, but certainly, once those turn on, we'll be able to f determine what value those would be, uh, those would have to us. And then finally, uh, the Energy Q, the um, San Rafael Exploration Project was recently bought by the former CEO of Energy Fuels, George Glazier, uh, and a, a group, uh, an investment group. And this is the same group that bought the licensed and permitted mill site. So uh, is should that mill ever get built and uh, revenue begin uh, starts to be generated from that site, then we would have a uh, royalty associated with one of those projects. Sure. Page 13, once again, this is for illustrative purposes only. Uh, don't, don't take this as gospel. These are simply uh, forecasts based on uh, you know, general market information. So, for example, you can see uh, we show consensus forecasts. Those are consensus analyst forecasts from uh, U.S. and Canadian banks uh, probably from at least two months ago. The numbers may have changed slightly since then, but you can see that this is where uh, the market assumes the uranium price will go. So, uh, given that it, it may take about two years for us to refurbish the mill and move into production, that's why we're looking at a tw 2017 start date in terms of uh, where we expect the uranium price to be at that point. So based on where we think production could go and could start, uh, we're looking at uh, revenue of $33 million in the first year, 2017, to up to uh, $67 million as we uh, improve production moving forward and get to full capacity production.
Corey, just quickly, I'm not sure if you have that information, but this con consensus price is that for the spot price, for uranium spot, because uh, all of us know that the spot price doesn't really matter because uranium is, uh, that the price of uranium is uh, uh, bilateral between the company and the producers. Sure. Well, so look, I, you know, I, I, I completely understand. I think for us, you know, we're trying to be conservative. So we're saying this is probably, you know, we'll call this, we'll argue this is term. If this is spot, given the historical relationship between the term and spot price, this, the term price tends to be some percentage higher than the spot price. Uh, yep. You know, if, if we're arguing that this is the term price, then obviously, the, you know, the uh, this is this is the low this is the low end of the market. Yep. If it is the spot price, it's never been made clear on the analyst uh, consensus numbers. If this is the spot price, then clearly, the term price be significantly higher and therefore our revenue and EBITDA numbers would be significantly higher. Yeah, so from from my feeling be... from my feeling this should be a, a forecast for the spot price but uh, okay sure. we don't know. Okay. Yeah. Either way I mean if, even if, if these are the the lows because if this is the spot price it means the term price is probably higher. Yeah. But if this is the term price then at least we know that this is the minimum that we should be looking for as we move forward. But once again the term price uh, is the significant part of the marketplace. The spot price represents 10% of the overall market, 10 to 15 percent. So, do you do you have any explanation why um, there will be, if we follow this forecast, there will be a, a, a bump in the share, pr uh, sorry, in the uranium price from 015, yeah, 40 bucks where we are right now, um, up to the 65, 68 level, but then for the next couple of years it's it's steadily stable, just shy of 70 dollars. Is there is this because they're planning? They're, they're forecasting that a lot of uh, other uranium will come on the market because more companies will get into production. Well, I, you know, I think, you know, I think forecasting, you know, let's talk. We're talking fortune <laughs> now. Uh, <laughs> the crystal Curry. ball, you have it there. Yeah, you the crystal thing. ball. That, that's exactly <laughs> it. That's exactly what happened. I think they, the same reflection starts in 2019 and on. Right. Um, I think, I think once you kind of get five years plus out, you know, it becomes very, very difficult to start determining what the price would be. So I think a lot of guys are saying, look, you know, once we get five years out, let's just talk about it's probably going to hold at a <coughs> steady state at worst and perhaps go up. But okay. as to how far it goes up, that's another question. But I think they feel much more, you know, comfortable looking at kind of a steady state at that point until there are more data points associated with it. Because I know that, uh, you know, utilities are starting to buy or will start to buy in the next few months uh, to fulfill contracts for 27, 2018, maybe 2019. So you'll get a better sense as to that point what the what the potential numbers could be going forward. Yeah. But but even with these low numbers, let's say that's low forecast numbers, um, yeah. you as Anfield, you feel pretty comfortable, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I think we could certainly, uh, you know, we could certainly, um, you know, be revenue generating at that point. Uh, we certainly believe we can, we can be cash flow generating, but. Once again, you know, this is all based on, this is just general numbers. We need to make sure that the economics uh, show uh, the same type of uh, ramp up, the same type of valuation, uh, because we need to do economics <coughs> on the projects. This is just from looking at what the consensus numbers are, looking at the capacity of the mill, and trying to determine, based on old reports provided by Uranium One, what the economics are related to the mill or with the mines that we're looking at. So, uh, okay. you know, these are very kind of general numbers, and I don't want anyone to take these as gospel, but we, we, we are very comfortable that, you know, at the revenue numbers, uh, or the, sorry, the, the prices provided by the uh, industry, you know, we're very comfortable that we could be uh, cash flow generating at that point. Okay. <coughs> to page 14, uh, once again, illustrated purposes only, just to give you a sense as to where we trade vis-a-vis -vis our peers, uh, when we talk about what we need to do to close a transaction, we need to get uh, essentially $5 million US in the bank or in the till in order to close the transaction. Given the market cap, our market cap is obviously a little bit lower than $9 million today, but we'll just use the same numbers that are on this chart. Uh, we have an implied EV of roughly $18 million, uh, an M&I resource of 6.8 million pounds. You know, when we look at what the average uh, company is trading at, it's roughly uh, $6.40. It's probably a little bit down from, from that point now, but I think everybody's kind of slid down. Uh, but when we look at what the implied value at the average price would be, you know, we're looking at you know, our stock price 
probably four times to five times higher than where it sits today. Uh, so, you know, I think the, the point here is that, you know, given the assets <coughs> that we're looking to acquire, looking, you know, given where we are vis-a-vis -vis our peers in terms of production, near-term production, you know, we're trading significantly lower than anybody else. Um, you know, I think some of that's a function of nobody really knowing us. I think some of that's a function of us not actually closing the transaction yet. Uh, but once we do, we think that we should be able to capture some of that disparity in the marketplace. Maybe we shouldn't be trading uh, in line with the average, but certainly we should be trading above where we are today uh, based on what assets we have uh, coming into the company. Yeah, I feel the same. So, I, you know, I'm following Anfield for a couple of months now, and uh, I think my first recommendation to my subscribers was around the 45 cent level. Um, and I was kind of, uh, yeah, it was interesting for me to see that even if the uranium price in the last couple of weeks had a yeah, moved up, yeah, that, that you stayed flat or even moved down, and I totally, and I, of course I made up my mind, yeah, and thought, okay, so the asset is good, yeah, and so everything is in place, um, and, and my feeling is that um, the market just doesn't believe that you are going to be able to, to finance this transaction, and um, so to me, this, this news release today is a really critical step, yeah, which you achieved, and um, I keep fingers crossed, yeah, that that finally there will be a signature uh, yeah. on these on these paperwork, um, and then the market should not have that. But that's my humble opinion. The market should uh, finally come to the conclusion that that Anfield is uh, way undervalued. I, I agree. I, you know, I, the, the market, you know, the market speaks, uh, you know, speaks for everyone. And basically, the the consensus seems to be that. Uh, there's some skepticism around our ability to close the transaction, and I think that's it's not just a it's just not a, you know an issue with Anfield itself, but I think it's also the fact that another party had attempted to acquire these assets and failed, uh, and wasn't able to get the, the financing in place. So now the market's saying, well, you know, given how tricky it was for the first group, you know, we can't really give credit to the second group uh, okay. until the transaction closes. So it's understandable. I mean, it's. You know, it, it's it's unfortunate for us uh, that we're the second second group coming in, but uh, you know that's the reality. But you know, I think for us, you know, lining up a lender uh, you know, with the with the um, expectation of having uh, you know a, uh, a financing in place, I think that will make the street much more comfortable, <coughs> and then we can move forward, and then we'll, we'll probably get value for the uh, acquired assets. Yep, I agree. So uh, page 15, so speaking of the deal itself, um, deal terms. So at closing, we have to provide uh, Uranium One with a million dollars uh, in Anfield shares, it's US dollars. Uh, we also have to provide two and a half million dollars worth of Anfield shares, uh, US to US Energy. Um, US Energy will have those shares in escrow and released over 36 months. And then we have to provide the five million dollars in cash to replace a portion of the reclamation bond associated with shooting Canyon Mill. So that's the money that we're looking to uh, <coughs> secure now, because uh, that's obviously the big hurdle. But that's the only finance, you know, financing uh, or cash-related uh, payment we have to make at closing. You know, the pa other payments we've been able to defer uh, fairly significantly. So for us, I think we're very comfortable just getting past this hurdle and then looking to secure funds or. or get into production prior to having to make any future payments. Now you can see post-production in Shittering Mill, um, we have to provide uh, a payment of $2 million to Uranium One on July 1st of 2017. Our aim is to be in production uh, by that time. And then we have to provide uh, Uranium One with another payment uh, July 1st of 2019 uh, of $2 million. So once again, we've deferred those cash payments uh, for a, a number of years in order to find ourselves in a better uh, financial position, but obviously been in a position to advance projects uh, to the point where either we're in production or we're near to production. Mm -hmm. And then uh, once we've uh, once we've been able to get into production or we're close to production, we also have to replace the remaining reclamation bond, which right now is sitting at 9.3 million in total. Uh, we'll be paying five of it, and we'll look to pay the remainder uh, in two years. Okay. So page, uh, let's go to page 17. We talked about the assets themselves and where they're located. You can see that uh, prior to uh, looking to acquire the Uranium One assets, we had uh, 
uh, some holdings in the Lisbon Valley area, obviously not as significant as the assets that Uranium One held, but uh, you know we did have a little bit of a foothold. But you can see how complementary the uh, Uranium One assets are to our uh, current assets. And uh, as I mentioned before, Lisbon Valley is the largest uranium district in Utah, and has produced uh, you know 77 million pounds of uranium at 0.3 percent. So uh, very good grade for uh, the U.S. Uh, the ISR producers uh, tend to produce using um, ore which has grades of 0.1 or less. Uh, so uh, when you look at 0.3 to 0.4 percent, it's actually quite significant. It's not once again, it's not Saskatchewan numbers, but the, this is a place where production has taken place. <laughs> so a little bit different. Um, yeah, and is, there are a number of. Uh, uh, is this. Um, uh, uh, in, in general, in this valley, is this uh, more, um, or how deep is the, the resource normally in this area? Uh, well, the resource doesn't uh, isn't significantly deep. Uh, you know, I think, you know, you're you're going probably maybe a couple hundred meters down. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not uh, they're not necessarily deep, uh, mm -hmm. deep resources. You know, and there are a lot of kind of a lot of deposits. What you find is that you don't necessarily find uh, large deposits where you find are a lot of pods, you know, probably a million pounds or less. Uh, so those seem to total up to significant numbers. You can find ones that are bigger, but there are a number that are a million pounds or less. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, we talked about the resource before, but you can see here uh, the first two velvet and wood that are listed are the two that are associated with the new 43101 resource. Uh, and the, you know, so there's obviously some inferred resource in place too, which is uh, probably 600 and, uh, between 630 and 640,000 pounds. So those could also be converted into m and uh, resource, which would push the size of that resource up to about 5.3 million pounds. Uh, the Frank M is uh, very close to the mill. It's lower grade, 2.2 uh, million pounds. So that uh, moving into production would obviously be contingent upon having a, a much higher uranium price than we have today. Uh, the Fidley tank is uh, obviously located in in Arizona, uh, and it's got a pretty decent size of just under a million pounds. But the weight project is interesting because uh, we own 50% of that project. The other 50% of that project is owned by Energy <coughs> Fuels. Uh, Energy Fuels bought the uh, the other 50% uh, probably uh, in the fall. Uh, so we are essentially partners with Energy Fuels on that project. They're they're pressure pipes, so it, they're they're uh, long cylindrical pipes uh, found in, in Arizona uh, in an area that is not uh, is not um, not an area that's where uranium is prohibited from being mined. Uh, there are, there's some areas in Arizona where you can't mine at all when it comes to uranium, but this is uh, in an area where you can actually go in and produce. And Energy okay. Fuels is producing in the area at the moment. This is the, the one area where Energy fu Fuels continues to produce ore. Page 19 uh, talks a little bit about the uh, velvet wood. Uh, you mentioned before, Joe, that uh, 4 million pounds of uranium and 5 million pounds of vanadium um, had been produced in the area. So once again, we'd expect to see some more vanadium coming out of this, this project. So uh, the idea of adding a vanadium circuit to the mill makes a lot of sense uh, because we could certainly uh, you know, exploit that and generate some, some further revenue and cash flow from uh, production at this mine. Uh, we also have a permit in place to potentially put this mine into production within the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, so that would obviously consist of us uh, shipping ore to another mill because the refurbished mill uh, or shootering would not be complete by the time we can get this up and running. But we obviously have alternatives. There are two other uh, standing mills in place that uh, could certainly take the ore that we could produce. Yeah, you just mentioned that. What, what is your timeline uh, or the term you need to refurbish the shootering mill? Well, we're looking to get into production by 2017. So given that we're essentially in 2015, we're talking about a two-year Two year. Two year okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Frank M project uh, we talked about earlier, right next to the mill, 2.2 uh, million pounds, a uh, low-grade resource, but certainly uh, a resource which would be appealing uh, once the uranium price uh, is significantly higher than where it sits today. Uh, but because of its proximity, I think it's it's very uh, very appealing to us. Uh, you know, should the uranium price move in, in the direction we'd like. 
Page 21, the Henry Mountains exploration target. Uh, you know, there are significant targets for exploration in the area. Uh, you know, Energy Fuels has a project in the area which has a 20 million pound resource. So we know that there's significant uh, ore in the area. So uh, we believe that given its proximity to the mill, uh, this would be a great place for us to exploit and, and find a, a resource that would be uh, high grade and, and amenable to mining at the mill. Page 22, Brescia pipes. Uh, we talked about this before, the weight product. It gives you an idea as to what the shape of a typical Brescia pipe would be. You can see it's very long, cylindrical, uh, vertical mining. Uh, so you're basically digging down deep, straight down uh, in order to get the ore. The great thing about uh, Brescia pipes, you can see the grades are 0.5 to 1% uh, U U308, which is you know, fairly high and, and in some cases significantly higher than what else you find uh, uh, in traditional and conventional uh, mine site. So uh, you can see the footprint on the right hand side is quite small because it is such a narrow surface. It is a, it's a deep um, it's a deep rooted pipe uh, so you can actually do very little surface disturbance in order to exploit uh, this type of mine. Okay. As you mentioned uh, we've got a 50-50 joint venture. Uh, it was no longer with Rose Petroleum but it's actually with uh, Energy Fuels. Energy Fuels bought out the, our previous partner um, and our portion of the inferred resource is just over 440,000 pounds. On to page 25. So this is just general market information. Uh, as we talked about in the past, there are so many reactors currently um, operating uh, and there are a significant number of, of reactors which are in place in terms of uh, what could potentially be built out. Uh, you can see that over 12% of the world's energy production comes from nuclear, uh, despite the fact that there's so many, been so many negative stories and the fact that Germany is actually uh, <laughs> moving away from... <laughs> from <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not my moving fault. From, <laughs> no, Not no, my fair fault. Enough, fair enough. Uh, yeah, they're moving away from uh, nuclear power, but there are also other company or other countries now looking to pick up that slack. As I mentioned, uh, the Middle East is getting involved, India, uh, China, uh, Russia, clearly, uh, you know, even Brazil is looking to uh, looking to exploit uh, this this resource. So, you know, you can see that 13 countries rely on nuclear energy to, to supply at least 25% of their total electricity. So it's it's a very difficult thing to move away from, uh, given the, uh, the cost of the alternative. So, um, you know, I think it's something that's here to stay, and the fact that there's a significant buildup continuing, uh, you know, I don't think that uh, renewable power or renewable energy will be uh, you know, the answer uh, to replacing uh, base load power that comes from nuclear. Now, page 26, we talk about what's being built. Uh, I think I mentioned 72 plants under construction right now. 28 of those, almost 40% coming out of China. Uh, planned and ordered reactors, uh, 174, and then 299 proposed. So. You know, if all of these were to get into production, you would more than double the number of reactors that are uh, in, in place today. So, uh, you know, as, as much as there are negative headlines about uh, uranium and nuclear power, you know, the world seems to be forging ahead trying to uh, put these this type of power source in place because of its uh, reliability, because of its uh, you know the clean power aspect uh, and base power, baseload power. I mean, renewable energy can't provide baseload power the same way that uh, new. Yep. Page 27, just talking about the directors and officers of the company. Uh, I think the one person to highlight here would be Don Falconer. Uh, Don Falconer has been in the business for 35 years, <coughs> uh, has worked in both uh, the nuclear uh, sector and on the uranium uh, public market side. Uh, he's been involved in sales and marketing of uranium. Uh, and I think he's a he's a great person to have involved in the company because, you know, as we move forward, we will be looking to secure some contracts, and I think Don will be the person who has the contacts and relationships in order for us to uh, to do so. But obviously, his experience on both sides of the market is is second to none, and for us to have someone like that on the board, I think is quite a coup for us to to get him. Let me ask you a question. Um, so you, you have a, a pretty significant BOD, board of directors, but you're the only guy really working. 
Like you're the <laughs> the only management uh, CEO, so you don't have a CFO, no COO, no whatever. Right. Well, we've got a part-time CFO, but you know, okay. we're actually we're going to be looking to upgrade. You know, once we get the re this uh, acquisition under our belts, we'll be looking to uh, you know obviously build out the team. Yeah, you need uh, yeah. to, yeah. and because you know, e just just with this fin financial transaction, yeah, I think you definitely need a, a full-time CFO who is experienced in that area. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, I think for us, you know, we don't want to <coughs> until we actually have the assets, you know, under our belts. You know, we don't want to actually start spending money that we don't have. Um, right. You know, but we yeah. once we once we are in the position to start moving the product forward, we're we're going to look to fill the slots that we believe are necessary to be filled. Uh, I think an important point to make, though, you know, the fact that the you know, it's just me as an officer of the company, uh, essentially. Um, you know, I think that it's important to understand that we have a very active board. Uh, you know, I speak to uh, these board members at least once a week, probably more, um, if not once a day, and they're very actively involved in the business. So it's not uh, it's not a case of uh, me operating in isolation. Uh, you know, we have a very very active board, and, and there's a lot of interaction okay. that takes place uh, on a daily or weekly basis, or some okay. weekly. And uh, that's the end of the presentation. <coughs> okay. Is there oh, any so questions? That's the Joe? No, um, I think it was, a, it was a good overview about the company. And uh, uh, I think my questions are, are uh, or you answer my question, what I gave. Well, but I really interrupt you. I was really unpolite. Sorry about this. But, uh, oh, no, not at all. I think that's just your it's way. Uh, <laughs> usually, it's usually, that we <laughs> usually that's my job to be unpolite. That's right. That's right. <laughs> no, I, I, look, I think it's great to stop you know, with our questions. I think we, we should certainly address the questions when we can because um, yeah. we want to make sure that, if they're, especially if they're in context, it's the best place to really address because you know, somebody may have the same question. So yeah. you know, I think it's great to to stop and just discuss whatever points are, are necessary at the time. Yeah. Nicole, so there's only one question from my <coughs> side too. Um, so, okay, you have this uh, one land on, 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 on this hand that you can finance, uh, hopefully, the, the transaction. But then you need more money to uh, uh, yeah, refurbish the mill, uh, have other paying mi milestones. Uh, so, what is really the plan, or how is the plan to can finance all the whole project that you can bring this uh, this this mill in production? Well, so there are a couple of things that I, I mentioned earlier that uh, you know there's there's state money available to us to uh, obviously help finance. But state money department. coming over with, uh, with with also equity. You must show some equity. The state coming with the other part of the equity or something. No, no. The state uh, the state provides uh, what are called industrial development bonds. Okay. So those bonds are kind of long-term, low-interest rate bonds. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, there are a couple of companies that are in, uh, in Wyoming who have secured those types of bonds from the state. One, one secured $20 million, another one secured $34 million. Mm -hmm. So we know that's available. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Secondly, the lender that we're using today or we're looking to use um, also understands our plan moving forward and has expressed an interest in helping us uh, from a lending perspective to... Uh, fund uh, further development of the assets. Thirdly, obviously, we're going to look at the equity markets because uh, we are an equity company, uh, so we'll look to do some funding through that vehicle. Fourthly, uh, we have the ability to monetize some of the assets that we do have. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the royalties have value. Uh, the stockpiles likely have some value, too. Um, then we can also try to get into production uh, prior to having the mill refurbished uh, using, for example, the Velvet Wood Mine, we can start production there and we can either toll mill at one of the existing mills or we can simply sell the, uh, the ore that we produce there to, uh, to one of the mills. So there are a number of ways for us to generate revenue in the near, in the near term or generate enough money for us to uh, refurbish the mill, we believe. Uh, the contract, what you do with the, uh, the lender, has the lender the potential to finance the whole thing? He does not have the potential. There's no, there's no uh, right of first refusal to go forward, uh, but he, the lender has expressed an interest in doing that, uh, given that he knows that uh, the project needs to be financed, uh, some of it <coughs> certainly through debt. Uh, the lender was certainly would like, it wants to build a relationship with us, uh, which isn't just a one-off. Uh, obviously, the best way to, to get further business is to 
do well by us this first round and then uh, hopefully be in, in the position to uh, participate or at least uh, you know, put their hands up for the, the following rounds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so I think um, because you, you talked in detail about the uranium market overall, and I think we're all on the same page here, yeah, that uranium over the next couple of years um, will go up. Yeah, the price of uranium has to go up because there will be more nuclear plants um, coming on stream. Uh, as we all know, yeah, that's public information. It's all around the world besides Germany. Um, and uh, so I, I have no doubt about the uranium price. And what I really like about um, Anfield is that it's not only uh, a uranium exploration or uh, company. Uh, I really like this this team up with this mill. Yeah, they have the assets, the mill, and this is, um, to me at least, that's unique, um, especially in the uranium sector. Yeah, we have a couple of um, precious metals companies that are going down the same way. Yeah, that they have some assets and they they try to acquire old mills and refurbish them. Um, so I think that's that's a very prospective strategy. Um, and at a market cap of below 9,000, uh, sorry, 9,000 would be really low, uh, nine, <laughs> nine, nine million, <laughs> nine million <laughs> uh, dollars, um, I think it's, it's really, uh, yeah, worth considering and then to invest into that company. Um, if you really want to be, uh, if you're risk averse and don't like to, to speculate, I would wait for um, really that this, this uh, financing agreement is signed. Yeah, because then, to me, there's almost no risk, yeah, no foreseeable risk. Um, but, of course, you get a way higher leverage if you, if you jump on the stock right now. That's my uh, humble opinion. Right. That makes sense. I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's important to note that uh, uh, you know, the uranium price is, uh, is moving in the right direction. Um, I think that uh, the uranium market's very small, uh, especially when it comes to junior uh, producers or near producers. Uh, I think it's um, important to, you know, back whatever horse you like to if you if you like the space. Uh, but you have to see what the potential upside is. Um, you know, guys who are in production today are facing challenges because the uranium price isn't necessarily high enough to sustain production. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think our uh, the way that we uh, have the project set up, uh, assuming all goes well, is that we're going to be in production. Uh, you know, we're aiming to be in production around the time when the uranium price really starts to lift. Um, so I think that, you know, we're almost bypassing the next couple of years of uncertainty or <coughs> volatility in the price, uh, you know, so we'll be in the position where hopefully some of that short-term, um, uh, you know, the short-term challenges have, have been kind of mitigated and, uh, you know, everyone's seeing kind of a, a more positive view uh, in the uranium space. Okay, so Corey, thank you very much for taking the time. Um, that was really, really impressive. Um, a lot of good and detailed information. Um, the website of the company is www.anfieldresources.com. Um, you have the presentation on, uh, available for download on the website. Is that right? Uh, we have a version of the presentation. Um, okay. You know, we're actually updating it now, so... Okay, good. Uh, and and also, um, there's your contact data, so when any uh, investor is interested talking to... Uh, or get some more information, he can probably call or email you directly, Corey, right? That sounds great, yes. Perfect. So, yeah, thank you very much again. Thank you, Joe. Thank Thanks, you. Corey. And, um, yeah, I yeah. keep fingers crossed, yeah, that, that the lender is going to sign the documents and then yeah. we are going to hook up again and, yeah, see, see what you're going to do then. <laughs> thank you very much. Perfect. Great. Thank you, guys.